Hey, what's up guys? Glad to have you here with Coach Carter on the College Chips 2K Legacy Mode series, episode 49.5. Last episode, UT Martin found themselves in the middle of one of the greatest NCAA tournament games. It was an instant classic for sure, and if you want to check it out in case you missed it, as always, I'll leave a link in the description to the playlist of the series. Okay, is everyone gone that hasn't watched it? Okay, awesome, because today we will be sitting courtside once again to find out our Sweet 16 opponent. The Skyhawks have pulled out two upsets and look to make it three in a row with a tango against either the defending champions, the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, or the Virginia Tech Hokies. We have an ACC battle today in the round of 32 with two squads that would keep UT Martin guessing depending on who advances today. Obviously with this being an interconference opponent, we have a previous game to look back on, which you don't normally get in March, so we have a little bit of a prelude. These teams have had one meeting, the Yellow Jackets walked into Blacksburg and delivered a crushing 39 uh, point defeat to the Hokies in the road back in December. Trust me, this Georgia Tech team is legit. We watched them in the national championship in the previous season of the series, winning it all as an 11th seed, the lowest ranked team to ever do so in NCAA history. This team reminds me a lot of the UCLA team we're about to see in real life. Make a lot of noise as a double digit seed, retain a lot of your core, and become heavy favorites for a final four run once again. With the Yellow Jackets clocking in at an even 87 points per game, the third highest in the business, and even more impressive so of a stat is their 17.8 assists, which is tops in the country. This team is a well-oiled machine on offense, and it all really starts out on defense. They'll press you full court all game long, and the faster that this team plays, the more comfortable they feel. They excel in a chaotic atmosphere, so VTech will definitely need to limit the mistakes. Looking at the defending champs roster, you're going to see a lot of their core is returning for this season with 5'11 lefty point guard Slade Channing leading the way and leading the ACC in three point percentage and assist to turnover ratio. Can't forget about Kevin Pinson as well, who was an underclassman coming off the bench last season, and he led the Yellow Jackets in scoring in the championship game a season ago. Ever since that game, Kevin Pinson has become a huge cog in this offense, and also wing player Daniel Ritter, he is a bruising slasher. Overall, this team is just ultra deep with five players averaging double digit points per game on the season. You're not going to see that too much. So now let's introduce the Virginia Tech Hokies playing with the chip on their shoulders trying to prove people wrong after finishing under 500 in ACC play this season. They defeated the 9 seed Providence in the first round by double digits pushing a pretty fast tempo themselves. 78 points per game, that's about league average in the ACC but they may be able to hang with G Tech if they shoot like they have recently. 37.3% from 3, that's second highest in the conference. And perhaps they should try shooting a few extras from 3 today too. They've only taken 638 threes on the season, which is actually bottom five in the conference. So they're selective on their shots from beyond the arc. I think it's a focal point for the Hokies to get the ball inside. They have two very promising big guys named Vlad Atkinson and Shea Barbie, who have more height and weight than anyone else on Georgia Tech down low, with the former Atkinson posting 17 points a night. The Hokies have a very likable backcourt too, albeit they seem to turn it over a bit too much, with sophomore point guard uh, Brett Hayes leading in assists, Mark Kramer is an up and coming junior two guard in the ACC with a really good mid range game. But I think my favorite player on this team is 6'4 sophomore Josh Forbes. He's mature beyond his years leading the Hokies in minutes played on the season by a wide margin. So let's head down to the court side seats and get the scouting report on UT Martin's potential next opponents. One other point I wanted to touch on is that the Hokies have six players who average at least 1.3 turnovers a game. Unfortunately, I couldn't go back and look at the box score of when these teams played in December, but I bet turnovers were a big culprit in the loss. So the Hokies have to make it a point to protect the ball tonight to keep up with Georgia Tech in this high octane offense and very scary defense, especially in the full court as we get off and running today. And look at Mark Kramer stealing the tip off from the Yellow Jackets, perhaps a sign of things to come, as perhaps if the Hokies can out-hustle the Yellow Jackets, they may be able to hang a little bit better than these two teams match up back in December, as Slade Channing will take the first field goal attempt, no good, and then out to Pinson, also a little bit long, but then Daniel Ritter goes into his hands for a third look at it, and that's just something that the Hokies cannot afford to give up tonight too much. They already have the height uh, advantage. It's one of the few advantages they have on paper. And then they give it away in the press break. So already you're seeing this high-octane offense. 
And this lightning fast tempo go to work with then Slade Shanning scoring off of the ball reversal. Slade Shanning 14 and a half points, four and a half assists on the season. He is the offensive leader for the Yellow Jackets and he's a lefty and people sometimes underestimate. Covering lefties is a little bit different than it is righties as then Daniel Ritter sends back Josh Forbes inside as Slade Shanning sets things up and Virginia Tech will then pack it in with this 3-2 defense. What a backdoor feed. Slade Shanning inside to Gilbert White who already has two out of the first three field goals for the Yellow Jackets and then another early turnover for the Hokies. Already six unanswered points as Mark Kramer misses the steal which leaves the back door wide open for Daniel Ritter. I see what the Hokies are trying to do. I really do, but once again another turnover. But I, I really see what they're trying to do. They're trying to set up this 3-2 zone and really bait the passes to the wing, but it's just not working out right now as this one swings over to Mark Kramer who then leaves it short. That's the best part of his game right there is his mid-range shot inside. Another delicious dime. This one will go for a three-point play. Slade Shinning links up with Kevin Pinson and the Yellow Jackets with 12 unanswered points right out of the gates as if there was any doubt on how legit this team was. Slade Channing with the hat trick already in the first three minutes. He has three assists. And Kevin Pinson is coming out firing on all cylinders. So then we see Vlad Atkinson, the leading scorer, a 6'8 senior from Charlotte, North Carolina, stepping up to the line as he knocks down two to get the Hokies on the board. This team shoots 74% from the line, so above average for the ACC standards. As Kevin Pinson steps into one, no good, and Atkinson finally grabs a rebound. And then we see Stedman Travis, who will find Mark Kramer. Travis is actually the highest overall player on this team. He's an 86 overall as a sophomore, but he comes off the bench and he is a very mature player. Six points, five rebounds, three assists. One of those players where his impact doesn't always show up in the box score. So Mark Kramer's on the board. His first basket is a flashy one in two attempts as Slade Channing looks for Daniel Ritter. And this one swings over to Kevin Pinson for three-pointer number two. 16 to four. It's been all Yellow Jackets as then Mark Kramer will score. And look at this press break. Look at Slade Channing and Mitch Fellers. They were just toying with the defense there as then Mitch Fellers finds Kevin Pinson for another tray ball. He's got 11 out of Georgia Tech's first 19 as then he almost grabs a steal right there as well. Mitch Fellers with his second assist. He's their backup point guard, a guy who would probably start on a majority of college teams as then Mark Kramer. He will attack Hanley Graves. That's the starting center, a 6'9 sophomore for the Yellow Jackets who averages eight points and leads the team with five and a half rebounds on the season. But Graves will make an early exit and it's actually kind of nice to see another team dealing with some foul trouble from the big guys. Because if you guys know one thing is Blaine Fry has been dealing with some whistles all tournament long and has barely played for UT Martin in their first two uh, NCAA tournament games as things coming pretty much out of control here for the Hokies. They're trying to speed it up to no avail. That's exactly the game that Georgia Tech wants to play. The Hokies are feeding right into the Yellow Jackets energy and they continue to turn the ball over play after play. 25-9 game as Pinson will spot up again for a three-pointer number four in the first five minutes. He's got 14 now. I'm telling you, Pinson is a microwave as finally the Hokies burn a timeout as Shea Barbie checks back in. Man, I don't know what else you need to see to truly show how legit this Georgia Tech team is. As we see here, Shea Barbie sets a pick for Stedman Travis, who then delivers a beautiful feed inside to Brendan Hayes, the starting point guard who actually is playing hurt this game. And he averages eight and a half points, three assists on the season, and he leads the Hokies in the former with a score of 31 to 14 now. Just gotta take a possession at a time. If you're the Hokies, that's what they do here. Colin Thompson, the backup power forward, would then find Shea Barbie, who's put together a couple nice possession series, made a couple nice passes. He's leading the rebounding battle for the Hokies up to this point. And I think Shea Barbie may be the X factor today if the Hokies want to at least keep this thing competitive. He's a 6'11 sophomore, 7 points, 5 rebounds on the season, but only 58% from the free throw line as he misses one there. Hokies have it back down to 15. They're bringing a the double this time. They continue to try to get into Shea Barbie. 
And this one will go to Mark Kramer at the elbow. No good. Colin Thompson on the follow, though. Kicking it out to Josh Forbes. A little bit long, but then Colin Thompson once again. Nicely done there. Thompson only plays eight minutes a game, but hey, sometimes it's your players at the end of your bench that can provide a spark. As Georgia Tech, they continue to be hard to stop. Look at that three from Xavier Grimes, their power forward, who shoots 34% from three on the season 10 points three rebounds and that will make it three pointer number seven over half of Georgia Tech's offensive income has become has come from beyond the line excuse me I'm just in disbelief at how these yellow jackets are shooting the lights out of the building and they're completely exploiting the three two zone defense from the Hokies as this one is swinged over to Josh Forbes there we go there's my favorite player he's up to seven points and not only is he my favorite player but you can tell the Hokies like him too he's a sophomore from Buffalo New York that leads this team in minutes per game field goal percentage and three-point percentage he shoots 47.8 percent and 94 attempts and he has one right there as then there is Mark Kramer finding uh, Shea Barbie inside for his third field goal Okay, so the Hokies, they're making it a little bit more competitive the further we go along here in this first half. They've cut down the turnovers in these final couple minutes. It's 45-31 now as this one swings over to Eddie Brewer. Some of the deeper bench guys checking in for the Yellow Jackets. This one to no avail. And then the no-look pass by backup point guard Chris Kamara, number four on the Hokies, is then picked off and then will lead to a three-point attempt and make for Slade Shannon. The southpaw with 14 points he's already reaching his season average here in the first half 48 33 it's pretty crazy <laughs> how much scoring we've seen in this game especially compared to the VCU game that we watched last round and look at Vlad Atkinson he has been held without a single point here in the first half and the frustration is starting to mount with a pretty physical foul call on Atkinson and you can see the body language on the Hokies even though they are making some pretty fair progress as we dwindle out down the first half. You can tell that this team is just really not into it. They're allowing almost 50 points to this Georgia Tech team with six seconds left to go in the first half. As look at this, Shea Barbie cuts off the lane for Eddie Brewer and forces him to step on the boundary line. So the Hokies will have one more attempt here at the end of the first half with two seconds left inside to Barbie who scored once again. All right, the 6'11 sophomore goes into the halftime break being the leading scorer for the Hokies. And I mean, hey, they have it back down to a dozen, which, you know, if you're Virginia Tech, that's about as good as you can ask after losing 27 to five at one point in this game. But with all these points scored and this being a very up-tempo game, it's turning into a track meet. I mean, it's just another reminder of the pretty funny and entertaining games we always seem to get when we watch CPU versus CPU action. And just last game we watched was Southern Illinois and VCU, and that one was a defensive gridlock until the very end. Barely any team struggled to get over 50 in that entire game, and then we see Georgia Tech nearly score 50 in one half in this game. So look at this, they're bringing a trap to Ray Barbie right out of the halftime speeches, and you know, it looks like Barbie's going to have some more defensive attention as we head into the second half with Hanley Graves, number 50, playing with two fouls, but he's still trying to block Shea Barbie's shot to no avail. There is Brendan Hayes' third assist, and he also has nine points. So the point guard playing hurt for the Hokies is having a very valiant effort there at the point guard position as that one's blocked by Stedman Travis. Kick out to Daniel Ritter, and it looks like the Hokies are getting some stops finally. Georgia Tech playing a little bit too fast, even for their own good now at this point. 11.44 left to go. The Hokies have it down to one, uh, or single digits rather, as this one's kicked around. There's Mark Kramer, who was looking for that mid-range jump shot all game long, you could tell. Okay, so the lead is back down to seven. They've come back from 22 points down to at least make this competitive, hopefully. Still a lot of basketball left to be played, but Kramer's now up to 11 points. Outside of Shea Barbie, this backcourt's having a pretty solid offensive day. As this one's given to Daniel Ritter, who goes up and under. Oh my goodness, what a take by Daniel Ritter. I told you, this guy was a bruising slasher before the game started. And here he is displaying it right here. Daniel Ritter, 10 points, 6 rebounds, and he also averages over 1 steal and 1 block on the season. He's a do-it-all, hard-nosed kid, and he's a very fun player to watch. 
So now 59 to 58 to 49 rather as we dwindle things down to nine minutes to go as that pass is tipped off. The rare turnover there by Stedman Travis and leading the way on the other end is Kevin Pinson. Travis with a bad foul there. We actually haven't heard much from Pinson. I'm sure you guys remember in the first half, Georgia Tech with 2018 points. Pinson had 14 of those. He was red hot out of the gate, but then he cooled off a little bit. That's his first basket ever since his hot start, missing the free throw. So it's still 11, 60 to 49 with nine minutes to go. Inside it, it's another turnover. The Hokies, they've had trouble protecting the ball all year long, and it's another foul, this time on Brendan Hayes. And the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets already in the bonus. I mean, they're already up to 16 fouls, the Hokies are, so they'll be in the penalty from here on out. And we still have a lot of basketball left to play with, as we see um, Kevin Pinson stepping up to the line, missing another free throw. And that's actually one of the few weaknesses for Georgia Tech. Their free throw shooting as a team is a little subpar for ACC standards. So now we've reached eight, inside eight minutes to go on the game. Time slowly but surely becoming a factor. Nice pass there from Brendan Hayes who's met with a trap and a good look from number 11 that just doesn't fall for the Hokies. It's now a 14 point deficit as Daniel Ritter can also step it out and hit a shot from beyond the arc from here and there, you know. 6'8", 243 pounds, but Ritter moves a lot quicker than his listed weight. So now the lead is back up to 15 with under seven to play now as Eddie Brewer. Look how deep he gets into his bag to this one. In between the legs, step to his right. He will absorb the bump on the jump shot from Chris Kamara and knock it down. Eddie Brewer, the senior coming off the bench, who only averages 10.6 minutes a game, goes deep into his bag for a flashy jumper and the free throw would be good as well. So now with a blink of an eye, it's now up to a 74 to 51 deficit that the Hokies face with under five minutes to go. It's been a game of runs and now Georgia Tech is enjoying one of their own as look at this shot right here. Slade Shannon looking for another three ball. And he's really been the leading guy on offense all season long and in the biggest game of the season for the Yellow Jackets all game long as well. Darnay Bencourt is gonna have his hands full on defense as Mitch Fellers then checks back in for some garbage time minutes. Knocks down a three there as Vlad Atkinson, the leading scorer on the season, now falls to 0 for 5 on the game. Atkinson has been very frustrated and that's been a big reason why the Hokies, they're starting to really fall off a cliff, their offensive production. And look at this, how about back-to-back -back triples for Mitch Fellers, absolutely dirty. He is a guy that would start on a majority of college teams, but this team is just so deep that he's their sixth man and he's a damn good one too. 87 to 63, the Yellow Jackets reach their season average on the nose with 87 points on the game. 63 from Virginia Tech. They made it a little bit close at one point, but you know, it just was not happening for the Hokies. This Georgia Tech team is just way too strong, and you saw it firsthand here tonight. In the first round game, we faced Georgetown, which was the most important game to win on the series. And in the second round, we had VCU, which was probably the toughest and most exciting game of the series. And now in the Sweet 16, from a you know, talent standpoint, I feel like this is going to be the hardest game of the entire series. A lot of different kinds of matchups we're seeing here in March Madness with Channing and Pinson both having 17 apiece. Yeah, this team can play and I would not be surprised if they repeat as champions. And, you know, I, it's just an amazing feat they accomplished tonight. 87-63, they didn't get complacent after beating Virginia Tech by almost 40 in the regular season. They picked up right where they left off and didn't give the Hokies a chance down the stretch. So I know I've gotten a lot of questions about the rest of the field. You know, I'm, I'm big on that. You know, whenever I'm watching a series, I love to see what's going on around the league, around the nation, or what have you. So... I'll take some time here at the end of this episode and show you guys the bracket if you stayed with me as long as you did. I appreciate it. As you see, they're set in stone. The defending champs against UT Martin. That'll be coming in the next episode. And I promise that that episode won't take as longer to get out as the VCU game did. I was just been really busy, so I'll definitely get that out a lot quicker. So we're going to recap the first weekend of March Madness, starting out in the playing game where we see Louisiana-Calcutta. 
then falling to Illinois after beating UTSA in the playing game. Illinois, just like in real life, had some trouble in the second round, but then ended up pulling away from Dayton. And then also nearly escaped the upset by BYU in the Sweet 16. So the Ally and I have punched their ticket to the Elite Eight. They're the ones who fell to Georgia Tech last season in the national championship. And we see UCLA, 11 seed in real life, 11 seed in the game, but falling in the round of 32 to Pac-12 opponent Stanford, Charlotte, and St. Louis as the Billikens continue to blow out their competition and then take the Stanford game by eight points. So they'll be taking on Illinois. And St. Louis is the only team in the entire nation that went undefeated in conference play this season. In the A-10, they went 16-0, which is a very impressive feat. So now in the West Regional, where the Wolfpack of NC State were the one seed, and everyone thought that was going to be a very entertaining matchup in the round of 32, but the Wolfpack blow out North Carolina 103-67. to So it looks like the younger brother there in basketball in North Carolina has become the older brother in that rivalry, as the Wolfpack don't have any issues with Texas Tech, who had an impressive win in Vill over Villanova in the round of 32. So, as we see here, UT Martin, not the only double-digit seed making the second weekend of the NCAA tournament. We see Tulsa taking down Utah State, and then a shootout exciting two-point finish. They take down the Razorbacks of Arkansas, and then keep it close with Oregon all the way through. The Ducks actually have the best three-point shooting team percentage-wise in the entire country, and the Golden Hurricane limited them to 58 points. Unfortunately, Tulsa's offense didn't do a whole lot better. In fact, they did worse, only 52 points from them, but a very impressive game there that the Golden Hurricane put together an overall run. So it'll be Oregon and NC State down there. So one versus two in the Elite Eight for the first two regionals as we switch over to the South Regional where we see our boys, the Blue and Orange, UT Martin making a lot of noise. He'd love to see it. We waited six seasons to see that. As we see here, they'll be taking on Georgia Tech. 1 versus 13 game. There's only been a handful of 1 versus 13 games in the history of March Madison. We'll talk about the, that more at the end of the episode. Then we see here Washington against George Washington in the round of 16. And I bet that was pretty annoying to deal with if you were the commentators with George Washington versus Washington. But the Colonels of George Washington take down the Huskies. 80 to 75 and this is big news for UT Martin because if somehow some way they can perform an all-time shocker and take down the defending champs Georgia Tech they'll be facing George Washington in the Elite Eight that's a pretty I mean that's as, about as easy as an opponent you can ask for whenever you're in the Elite Eight so perhaps if UT Martin can somehow knock off the Yellow Jackets that's about as easy of a road you can have to make the final four. That would be crazy. To, that's crazy to even think about. <laughs> but anyway, we'll move along with the Midwest uh, where we see the Maryland Terps. They are the number one seed here. And look at this. Not only is UT Martin not the only double digit seed to make the Sweet 16, but they're not the only 13 seed to as well. The Matadors of Cal State Northridge take down Western Kentucky and then Wisconsin Green Bay as the Phoenix of Green Bay took down Arizona themselves. But then that Cinderella story got kind of uh, a little ugly here, <laughs> 113 to 57. So Maryland's in the Elite Eight after they steamrolled the Matadors. And as we move down here, I mean, hopefully UT Martin's one versus 13 game can go a little bit better. But as we move down here to the bottom of the West Midwest Regional, it went about as conventionally uh, as you can ask for with Duke taking down Boston College in the Elite Eight. So that means one versus two matchups in three out of the first four regions, or all four regions, I should say. So this has been a pretty conventional March Madness in terms of the Elite Eight teams. Not many Cinderella's, except for George Washington. They're the, you know, Oral Roberts, if you will, of this tournament. And perhaps UT Martin can join them in the Elite Eights as they take on Georgia Tech next episode. That'd be pretty hilarious with one versus two seeds in the first three regional finals. And then you have one that's just 13 versus 10. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be hilarious. There's been only six times that a 13 seed has made the Sweet 16 with UT Martin joining 
1988 Richmond team, 1998 Valpo team, 1999 Oklahoma team, 2006 Bradley team, 2012 Ohio Bobcats team. I remember that game. I'll talk about that a little more in a second. And 2013 LaSalle did it. So UT Martin only becomes the seventh Sweet 16 team that is a 13 seed. So that's pretty crazy already. And they have a chance to write even more history as the next video comes out against Georgia Tech. I remember that Ohio Bobcats game. I remember they nearly uh, beat North Carolina in that Sweet 16. And Ohio, um, they were dealt a pretty good hand as well because uh, Kendall Marshall, the UNC point guard, I'm sure you guys remember him. He had a couple seasons in the NBA, really good passer. He actually broke his wrist in that tournament. So UNC was a little bit understaffed, but Ohio made it close all the way through, taking them to overtime. That's the last one versus 13 game I can remember as a college basketball fan so I mean hey maybe we'll have some Ohio Bobcats luck as the next episode will be UT Martin versus Georgia Tech I hope you join me that video will be coming out very soon I appreciate you guys tuning in today and as always stay tuned for that and a lot more content coming out on my channel appreciate you guys stopping by today peace everybody